Hello everyone and welcome to the Ocean County Historical Society's temporarily virtual speaker series. As our regulars know, we usually host these at our museum in Tom's River, but due to the pandemic, we are now online. Thank you all so much for joining us today. My name is Melissa Ziobro and I am a trustee of the Historical Society. I am hosting these online talks on behalf of our president, Mr. Brian Bavasso, who usually hosts them when we are in person. As always, thank you, Brian, for all the work you do on the Society's behalf. I'd also like to thank some other trustees who made today's event possible, Barbara Roish and Mickey and Richard Kuntz. Now, I have just a few housekeeping announcements before we dive into today's program. Today's speaker series, like so many of our events, is free, but we do rely on your donations to keep us going and to continue our mission, telling the stories of Ocean County. We'd like you to know that you can donate from the safety and convenience of your own home via our website, oceancountyhistory.org. You can also sign up to be a member there. Perks include our award-winning newsletter, early registration and discounts on some programs, and more, all outlined on our beautiful website. Please know that we are open on Tuesdays and Wednesdays from 1 to 4 by appointment, which can be made by emailing oceancounty.history at verizon.net. That info is on our website, too. I'd also like to remind you that we are on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Please follow us on the platform of your choice or on all. Speaking of YouTube, please know that today's program is being recorded for use on our YouTube channel. Our next lecture is April 11th, and it is called 19th Century New Jersey Photographers with longtime Monmouth County archivist Gary Soretsky. With all that, on to today's event. Professor Sean McHugh is a senior archaeologist at a cultural resource consulting firm adjunct professor at Monmouth University and co-director of the Archaeological Field School of Monmouth University. He has over 17 years of experience in archaeology and historic preservation to include, as he's about to tell us, work at Cedar Bridge Tavern. So now let me stop talking and give the floor to Professor McHugh, who will talk for about 40 or 45 minutes, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. Take it away, Sean. Can you see my slides? We're good? We can, we're good. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm so glad to be here, virtually at least. And I suspect that all of you are in the same boat as I am. Looking forward to warmer weather, human interaction. After all, I am an anthropologist. To start, I would like to extend my thanks and appreciation to Barbara and Melissa for making this happen. But Melissa will tell you it doesn't take much to get me to talk. I would be remiss if I said nothing about Tim Hart. This is his vision and as director of Ocean County Cultural and Heritage Commission, a great deal of thanks much go to him. Before we start discussing archaeology and all things Cedar Bridge, I'll tell you a little about myself. Since I can remember, I've always been captivated by history, so much so, I graduated from Monmouth University in 2001 with a degree in, well, history. What does one do with a history degree, you ask? I painted houses for my landlord. A friend of mine was living in one of the houses and she returned one day very dirty, I like football practice dirty. I asked her what she did and she told me that she was an archeologist. Naturally, Indiana Jones comes to mind and I was intrigued. I asked if she can get me a job. My first ever post-school interview was with a man I now call a friend and mentor and was all of three questions. I was asked simply and they were very important questions. Did I mind being outside? Did I know how to use a shovel? And did I, was I okay with being rained on? I answered yes. And well, here I am. Since obtaining my master's degree, which is a requirement, I've been a principal investigator at Richard Grubb and Associates and an adjunct at Monmouth University, and I am loving it. We're gonna cover a lot of ground today, starting with the background in archeology span to the history and investigations of the tavern. I will answer all of your questions, and I hope I will intrigue you enough to have some. So, Right. So what is archaeology? To start, I'm not a paleontologist, so fossils and dinosaurs are out. My daughters get very upset when people think that. My youngest even had her fifth grade teacher write a letter to a textbook company correcting that very mistake. Archaeology itself is a social science that falls under the larger umbrella of anthropology, which is the study of human societies and cultures. In archaeology, we study humans through the material remains they leave behind. We do this through our field work, which is the recognition, observation, collection of archaeological evidence in context or placement. A wise man once stated that social science is a complex way of stating the obvious, and it is. 
But to me, archaeology and my Irish Catholic upbringing is a large fiendish jigsaw puzzle invented by the devil as an instrument of torment. Since it'll never be finished, you don't know how many pieces are missing. Most often they're lost forever, and you can't look at a picture on the box to cheat. On the screen are just a few places I've had the opportunity to work. And while I love the sands of this Jersey Shore and the riches to be had here, I have recently introduced to Caribbean archaeology. And while I love all things archaeology, the weather is nicer down there, and so is the food. Just my opinion. The most important word in that definition of archaeology is material. Without it, you're just digging holes. What is this material? To us, we call them artifacts. And quite simply, it can be anything made, used, or altered in some way by humans. Knowing your material is the most important part of the trade, and it takes time. When asked for advice by recently graduated undergrads what they should do next, I kindly tell them to go get lost in the field. Literally, go work in the field for as many companies and as many part of the countries as you can and learn your material. Then come back and get your master's. While some of what is pictured can be obvious, knowing the difference between stoneware, earthenware, ironstone ceramics matters. And the most difficult to identify are the prehistoric ceramics shown on the bottom right. Archaeological assemblages are all about patterning. What is absent is equally important as what is present. For an archaeological site such as Cedar Bridge Tavern, the artifacts tell us what happened. Aside from the broad date ranges, is it a cup, a bowl, or a mug matters. This will indicate to be a small scale family use or mass consumption you would see, say, at a restaurant or a tavern. What kind of glass vessels are present? What do you, would you expect at a tavern site? Features are artifacts that are not movable or if moved will destroy their defining characteristics. Here's the thing. Archaeology is a destructive science. We single-handedly kill our informants. So we have to get it right the first time. My nightmares are filled with the possibility of blowing through a feature while digging. In archaeology, we follow a few principles. First, the deeper you go, the older it is. Pretty standard, really. But if you dig a hole, you change the makeup of the soils, which mixes things up a bit. Both principles help us understand post-depositional processes, or in layman's terms, what happens to the ground after the artifacts are placed. Features are very important. They're very important. They are intrusions into natural soils. We must carefully document every step via notes, drawings, measurements, and photographs. Features in many ways are capsules evident of a singular moment or duration in time. Just think of a privy or an outhouse. Archaeologists employ a variety of methods and tools. As stated by the venerable Dr. Jones, the library and research is the most important tool. At the very least, we conduct background research to have an idea about what we might encounter. Archaeology is labor intensive. And because of this, we utilize sampling strategies to hone in potential archaeological deposits. Shovel testing depicted on the right at the bottom of the screen helps us cover a larger area. These tests are generally placed on a 50-foot interval grid focused on the presence of cultural material. After the material is identified, we use larger excavation units measuring three foot or five foot squares to expose potential features. And most of this work is done by hand. In some cases, depending on the background research, we'll use heavy equipment, as well as it is also easiest to metal detect for military related sites. Up to this point, we've gone over a few things about archeology, span but if there's one thing I can press upon you it would be simply this saying, where and when. Where was the material found and when does it date to? The where is extremely important. Where in the field, where is located? What test, how deep? To record this information, we use high-end GPS devices and total stations. So for those keeping track, you can add surveying on the list of things I'm capable of. It is so important that I spend my time at MAMA teaching a computer mapping program capable of this. I would also say that we are very territorial and some of the pictures will eat in the larger excavation so that nobody can come in and take over. So that's a picture of myself and a buddy of mine, Mike Gall, having lunch in a cellar field in, in Fieldsboro. Archaeology in the U.S. can be broken into two groups, academic and cultural resource management or CRM. Up until the late 60s and early 70s, much of archaeology conducted was university-based. Minus the Nazis, think of Indiana Jones. There are some government programs too, thanks to the New Deal. 
but it was the National Historic Preservation Act of 1966 that gave birth to archaeology as a profession. To some, the federal government must take into account how their undertakings would affect historic properties. States have also piggybacked on this law and have their own permitting requirements. Historic properties can be anything from buildings to landscapes to archaeological sites. The Act has two sections that are pertinent to us, Section 106 and Section 110. Section 110 states that the federal government requires a list of all cultural resources on their property. Section 106 creates what are known as the SHPOs or TRIPOs, the State Historic Preservation Offices and the Tribal Historic Preservation Office. And it lays out the means in which things get determined for listing, known as criteria. They're on the left side of the screen. Quite simply, they can be interpreted as this. Washington fought here, Washington lived here, Washington built this, and then D is Washington used the bathroom here. Most of archeological sites will fall under D. But in order to accomplish their determination, there are three types of archeological investigations or phases. Phase one can be broken into two tasks, but its purpose is to determine presence or absence. The goal behind a phase two survey is to determine if the archeological site is eligible. Think, let that sink in. Not all archeological sites are considered eligible. Lastly, a phase three is considered a mitigation. The site is considered eligible. It will be destroyed by the development. Therefore, we conduct an archeological data recovery. But we don't dig for the sake of digging. The site is important enough that it can address specific research questions because of our work. This is important for all the work conducted at Cedar Bridge Tavern was a part of this process. Okay, congratulations. You all have successfully passed a crash course in modern archeology. span Let's get to the background history or well, the prehistory of the Cedar Bridge Tavern project. Sadly, we do not get to choose what we pull from the ground. I have found far too many creepy doll parts for this to be true. But we do have to prepare for everything. As we all know, New Jersey was occupied by Native Americans well before European settlers arrived for some 12,000 years. And for the most part, these cultures predate our contact period ideals of New Jersey groups like the Lenape. These time periods that predate European contact are divided into three cultural affiliations, Paleo-Indian, Archaic, and Woodland with the latter two being subdivided into early, middle, and late. The basis for these determinations are mobility and the advent of prehistoric ceramics. Why are we discussing this? That's a great question. Native American occupation is predicted on environmental sustainability. Good, flat ground near a water source are indicators of the potential of finding such material. The tavern, located on a flat terrace overlooking the east branch of the Wading, Wading River, makes it highly probable to contain prehistoric artifacts. And well, it did. Okay, now for the historic background of the property. We're gonna start with the deed and title research, which I am ashamed to admit is not my cup of tea. But alas, in my profession, we have researchers who do this and they're darn good at it. Given the age of the property, research was conducted at three repositories in Monmouth Ocean in Burlington County. I do have a love and appreciation for these files though. We chide the youth of today for posting too much or posting everything on social media, but we forget that during the 17th, 18th and 19th century, official documents contained all of the sordid affairs of everyday life. And in many cases, the means for retaliation. These truly were the gossip papers, so to speak, and official ones at that. The history is long and well-written by a colleague of mine. If I was to discuss it all, it would truly take up our allotted time. So I'm gonna cherry pick some of the good parts. The Cedar Bridge Tavern is situated on a property that was purchased on December 4th, 1712 by Thomas and William Fox, who are residents of New Hanover Township, Burlington County. They purchased it from John Fox of Great Britain. Initially, the property was comprised of 333 acre parcel in Shrewsbury, Monmouth County and the province of East Jersey. At the time of the transaction, the division line between the provinces of East and West Jersey surveyed in 1685 were located west of Cedar Bridge Tavern. The division line was later relocated east of the tavern property in 1743, but the original line remains to demarcate the, ba the boundary between Burlington and Monmouth counties. During their ownership, William died and Jonathan assumed control of his share of the property. And on October 8, 1743, a 233 acre portion of the original parcel now in West Jersey 
was sold to John Monroe of New Hanover Township. Monroe held title to the property and was eventually sold to John Middleton Jr. in an unrecorded deed. It is unclear if Morrow directly transferred the lot to Middleton or when Middleton purchased the tract. The parcel was likely smaller than that which Morrow purchased and may have consisted of 101 acres along the Wading River. It is on this property that the Cedar Bridge Tavern now stands. By 1750, the track was located in newly formed Stratford Township, Monmouth County. It is plausible that the sale between Morrow and John Milton took place around 1761 when Morrow, a yeoman, and by 1787, owner of several mill shops and at least one ironworks, sold Joseph Stewart, John Middleton, and George Middleton several tracts of land of Cedar Swamp along Beaver Dam Brook, a tributary to the Pole Bridge Book. At the time, John Falks was issued a warrant for a survey of the land adjacent and west of Morrow's track. It is unclear if Morrow developed the property that eventually became under John Middleton's possession and later became known as Cedar Bridge Track. But adding further confusion to the development and site use of this property is the probability that during the 18th century, more than one locale was known as Cedar Bridge. Earlier though, on September 11th, 1746, a newspaper transcript reported that Reverend Whitefield preached at Cedar Bridge, among other locales in Southern New Jersey, suggesting a building may have stood nearby. However, the location referenced by Whitehill is not cleared, as mentioned, several other locales were referenced in Cedar Bridge during the 18th century within 12 miles of the property. Indeed, a structure known as Cedar Bridge or Cedar Creek Bridge existed over Cedar Creek on a road leading to Egg Harbor, now Route 9, 12 miles northeast of the property. Conversely, the road to Egg Harbor may have been the road from Cedar Bridge to Tuckerton in Egg Harbor. Further, a third bridge at the crossing of the road leading to Egg Harbor and Cedar Run eight and a half miles southwest of the property may also have been known as Cedar Bridge. The latter location may be near present day Beach Avenue in Stafford Township, where an 1803 deed between Reuben Randolph and the Methodist Church referenced a road to the bridge over Cedar Creek. The identification of the property marker near the tavern strongly suggests though that the property John Morrow Parish included the present day Cedar Bridge Tavern. However, the initial development of the, of the data property is less clear. If Whitefield's visit took place at the 101 acre Cedar Bridge track, it suggests that a small community likely surrounded a mill or forge operation and possibly a tavern was present by 1746. In fact, Morrow's interest and involvement in entrepreneurial pursuits and mill ownership does suggest that his 1743 purchase of the track and other nearby Cedar Swamp tracks may have been an attempt to construct a mill or forge, an operator's residence, or a tavern on the property. Likewise, it may also have been an attempt to purchase property, the value of which that would have undoubtedly increased when resold as the need for industrial enterprises intensifies with population growth during the 18th century. Cedar swamps were ideal resources for procuring ancient fallen timber that could be milled or used in building and structural cheese. The swamps also contain valuable bog iron, also known as bog iron or limonite, which could be refined in iron forges. Perennial water sources of cedar swamp tracks, if dammed, could provide energy to power water wheels and a mill or forge operation. Mills and forges served as the hubs of the communities, without which grain could not be processed, timber could not be milled, and iron could not be forged, all of which enabled the construction of buildings, economic vitality, and commerce and employment. A late 18th century map, however, plots a mill or forge along the Wading or Swago River, just northwest of the current location of Cedar Bridge Tavern. It is unclear if this mill stood on the current tavern property, but the map suggests it was more likely on an adjacent track. The mill have may have been inaccurate in its depiction of the mill or forge as no reference to such a structure on the 101 acre track was made during the 18th or 19th century. But reference to a mill dam on the adjacent one and a half acre track was made as early as 1813 and continued into the mid 19th century. No 18th or 19th century mills or forges survive today in or adjacent to this 100 acre track. Though portions of a modern dam, possibly related to the early mid 20th century cranberry bog operations, exist along the south side of the pond on the east branch of the Wading River, northwest of the tavern. The 1781 map depicts the region surrounding the property to have been undeveloped except for the mill and an unidentified building along with the roadway towards Jobstown. The 1781 map also indicates that a building stood in or adjacent to the property on the south side of the road. The current very early 19th century Cedar Bridge Tavern building postdates the structure depicted on the 1781 map 
indicating an earlier building, possibly the mill owner or the tender's home, a farmstead or a tavern may have stood in or adjacent to the property during this period. There's no mention of a mill or tavern in John Middleton's 1799 will, further suggesting that a mill was on an adjacent property, that it was no longer operational, or that an earlier building near the present day Cedar Bridge Tavern may have been raised or removed by this time. Though John Middleton owned the track until 1804, he resided elsewhere. Instead, the track appears to have occupied by a series of tenants, only some of whom were identified in the historic record. It is possible that Nicholas Smith in a 1773 newspaper advertisement may have resided on the Cedar Bridge track that year, though his occupation on the track is questionable. Further, Isaac Warren's house is referenced near Cedar Bridge in 1774, Cedar is spelled with an S in this case, and it is possible that Warren leased the property at the time. At some point during the 1770s, map evidence indicates that the area of Wading River and Yellow Dam Branch was known as Pettit, Cedar Bridge, etc. The Pettit reference on the map is Nathaniel Pettit, a newspaper advertisement dated January 1st of 1778, in which Pettit sought woodcutters and laborers for salt works 18 miles south of Little Lake Harbor, situated Nathaniel Pettit's place of employment over 25 miles southeast, southeast of the Cedar Bridge track at the time. However, his presence in the area and his appointment in the craft trade suggested he may have possessed craft or manageable skills and many have worked in the Cedar Bridge area. Right. Chronological time frame allows us to divert from the minute or two for the monotony of property specific history and discuss a more interesting period, the Revolutionary War. But it is not without its controversy. On December 27, 1782, a brief skirmish takes place at a location known as Cedar Bridge. The skirmish took place between Captain John Bacon and his loyalist supporters and local militia under the command of Captain Richard Trier and Captain Edward Thomas. During the skirmish, Locals supporting Bacon came to his aid and fired upon the militia, resulting in the death of one patriot and the wounding of four loyalists and four other patriots. The diversion created by Bacon's local supporters allowed the wounded captain to flee to Egg Harbor. In October of 2012, National Geographic and the cast members of the television program Diggers performed a metal detection survey of the Cedar Bridge Tavern property, as well as a portion of the New Jersey state-owned parkland on the north side of Old Halfway Road. The survey did not result in the production of a map depicting the, the location of collected material or a technical report. But Dan Sivlitz of Battlefield Restoration and Archaeological Volunteer Organization, or Bravo, obtained access to the artifacts and GPS data that National Geographic gathered from the north side of the road. Artifacts recovered from the Cedar Bridge Tavern property may include musket balls fired from a brown best firearm. Based on Sivlitz's review of the data collected in North of Cedar Bridge Tavern, 13 recovered artifacts consisted of lead buckshot, buttons, a mule shoe, buckles, a spoon, and various hardwares. While David Fowler suggests the skirmish may have taken place at another location known as Cedar Bridge Tavern, 12 miles northeast of the property, archaeological data collected from metal detecting survey near the property hints to the skirmish may have taken place in present day Cedar Bridge Tavern. Well, after the war, John Middleton still owned the Hunter and Acre One track, which he referred to as Cedar Bridge Farm or Plantation. Cedar again with an S. Middleton also occasionally recorded his residence in Stafford Township, but it's questionable if it was at Cedar Bridge. It is important to point out that the property was not referred to as a tavern in this document, suggesting that it may not have served a function at this time. In reference as a plantation, however, it indicates that it was likely developed by 1799. John's will specified that his son, Joel Middleton, would have life use rights to the Cedar Bridge property, and upon his death, it was to be sold by executors of his will. It is unclear if or Joel Middleton resided at Cedar Bridge Tavern. In 1840, census data indicated that John Vundermuth, a 41-year-old farmer of German birth, resided at Cedar Bridge with his wife, Elizabeth, a man between the ages of 15 and 20, who's possibly his son, a man between the age of 30 and 40, and his two daughters. Working in the vaults in the household were employed in agriculture and commerce trades. John, John's property appeared to have abutted by Mos, Moses Haley and Samuel Rogers, who previously owned the Cedar Bridge Track. On an 1842 United States Coastal Survey map provides the first detailed visual glimpse of the Cedar Bridge Track. The house stood on the south side of Old Halfway Road, and on the opposite side of the road stood two outbuildings, possibly consisting of a barn and another storage structure. All three buildings were located within a small square agric agricultural field that straddled the road. 
No male buildings were depicted near the pond on the north side of the road, indicating that the pond was not used for power at this time. The road continued to be important thoroughfare through the Pine Barrens, though the area along the road remained sparsely developed. Of note was the presence of our home and hotel, roughly 1,400 feet to the northwest of Cedar Bridge Tavern property, indicating that the stretch of old halfway road east and west of the Wading River was an important locale for travelers journeying journey between Philadelphia and Egg Harbor. The area surrounding the, far, the farmstead was characterized as forested woodland, and by 1850, after Monmouth County was divided and the southern half formed into Ocean County, John Vandermuth was enumerated on the federal census between neighbors Samuel Guyberson and Moses Headley. He's listed as a farmer with a real estate value of $2,000. His son James was a laborer and who has worked on his father's farm. His other residents included, again, John's wife Elizabeth, daughters Harriet, Catherine, and Mary, as well as toddler William. Tenant laborers included 35-year-old Joseph Guyberson, a German board 20-year-old John Bowers, a 35-year-old Dutchman named Henry, whose last name was recorded as a Dutchman, and 52-year-old Samuel Birdsall. Three years after the census documented the members of John's residence, he received a tavern license for his home in Cedar Bridge. He subsequently received a tavern license in 1854 and 1856. No other, no earlier tavern licenses, if any, survived for John. To keep a tavern at his home, John was required to own an extra feather, two feather beds and one additional necessary house or privy. Farmers such as John commonly operated taverns in their homes, particularly those located along main routes like Old Halfway Road and Old Cedar Bridge Road, on which Cedar Bridge tracks straddled. Taverns were operated to enable a household to acquire additional revenue, especially during economically lean periods or during spouts of from family economic strife. The tavern, like other rural contemporary taverns, would have functioned as a locale where community members gathered to drink, eat, and socialize, where politics could be discussed, news disseminated, where teamsters, merchants, and drovers could feed their horses and get the nice rest, among other activities, where public meetings were held. They also functioned as stage shop for travelers. The Bauer family with Joseph Garberson and Elizabeth Wondermuth moved from Cedar Bridge Tavern prior to 1870 and likely as early as 1864. The 1870 census enumerated two individuals after Robert Holman listed as a hotel keeper. Both were tenants who reported have no real estate or personal estates valued at 200 bucks. The first was Edward T. Han and the second was Samuel Penn. Both listed themselves as hotel keepers. Prior to the census enumeration, Han received a license to hold a tavern or a public house at his home for the years of 1865, 66, and 67. Samuel Penn received a license in 1870. As with John Vandermuth, it is possible that other licenses were granted, but only those from the aforementioned years survived. Based on the census alone, it is unclear which of the two families occupied the Cedar Bridge Tavern. However, oral history provided by Patricia Newman, a descendant of Han, who went by the name Thomas, strongly suggests that the Han family occupied the Cedar Bridge Tavern. In 1870, Edwin, a 24-year-old hotel keeper from England, may have resided at the tavern with his 21-year-old wife, Lucy, and their daughters, Sarah J. and Sarah's mother, Sarah Guyberson. Edwin may have moved into the home in 1865 when he applied to keep a tavern at his house. Edwin may have also operated a passenger or mail stage from his home. The presence of two or three proximate taverns or hotel along Old Cedar Bridge and Old Halfway Road is undoubtedly curious, as the area around Cedar Bridge track was, was only sparsely developed. However, as a heavily traveled route between Philadelphia and the Jersey Shore, it was possible that accommodations such as inns and taverns were a necessity, uh, necessary and welcome rest stop for travelers in sparsely settled Pine Barrens. Noteworthy, was the absence of a mill on either side of the Yellow Dam branch or on the east side of the Wading River. Joan Berkeley, who also performed the historic background research for the Cedar Bridge Tavern, does not identify an occupancy for the buildings in the 1880s or the 1890s, but she notes that the Cedar Bridge is identified as a farm in tax records for this period. This is because Ocean County Tavern License after 1833 required specific tavern locational information and affidavits from neighbors, both of which were lacking for Cedar Bridge Tavern. She also states that the tavern license did not exist for Ocean County starting in 1895. The period after 1880 saw decreasing requests for tavern licenses as new roads and railways drew transportation and business away from the tavern locations. 
Overlooking the pond of the Wading River, when constructed, the original portion of Cedar Bridge Tavern appears to have com comprised the western two-thirds of the current building. The dwelling stood as a 225 and a half foot wide by 30 and a third foot long, three bay gable end, two-story frame dwelling with a full cellar and attic or garret. The gabled ends of the structure were oriented on an east-west axis as to maximize solar exposure and aid in the warming of the house during the cold winter months. The building walls would have been packed with brick or clay nogging, a form of insulation used to retain heat. The original structure contained a Georgian facade exemplary of the contemporaneous popular des design that conveyed order and symmetry. Symmetry on the front, rear, and sides of the original structure were permitted through the building's festrations and the centrally placed door on the dwelling's front and rear facade. The front entrance to many rural dwellings in the Mid-Atlantic region are typically on the south side of the building if the building doesn't front a pre-existing road, as may have been the case for the Cedar Bridge Tavern. The first floor of the original structure contains a large front room corner staircase and corner fireplace, south of which are two ancillary rooms or chambers. A corner bar now stands in this room. However, it's unclear if the bar was original to the structure when it was built. Historic American building surveys also note evidence of a former division between the two south rooms. It is possible that these rooms were initially intended to serve as a hall and parlor, or one or more bed chambers, only of which would have been heated, but this is purely speculative. The form of the existing corner fireplace characterized by the Rumford-like Chafford in-sloping sidewalls designed to more efficiently radiate heat into a room were common from the mid-1790s to the mid-19th century. It is possible that the hearths were modified after the dwelling was built, perhaps during renovations that took place when the two-bay eastern addition to the structure was erected. The absence of a cooking or heating hearth presence of chimney stack on the east side of the end of this addition suggests its use for a wood or coal burning heating or cooking stove, which became popular by 1830s, particularly after the introduction of coal to New Jersey. Constructed during or soon after the 1830s, the eastern addition likely served as the kitchen wing. If original to the original construction of the dwelling, the size and shape of the extent corner fireplaces would likely not have been conducive for cooking suggesting that a detached out or summer kitchen may have stood nearby. Such ancillary structures were a major component of 18th century rural homesteads, farmsteads, and even taverns, and typically stood between 35 and 50 feet of the dwelling. The space between such buildings was warranted as suitable precaution against destruction of the dwelling when or if the out kitchen caught fire, which was common. Out kitchens also served to restrict heat generated from cooking during the hot summer months to the ancillary building in order to keep the dwelling cool. Archaeological evidence from New Jersey also suggests that by the second quarter of the 19th century, the use and construction of out kitchens had become unpopular, and many homes by this time were either enlarged, were constructed with more floor space relative to their 18th century predecessors to accommodate a kitchen or a kitchen wing, or the out kitchens were moved and attached to the main dwelling. The space pr provided by the dwelling cellar, exterior access to which was through a bulkheaded entrance on the south side of the building, and space in the garret over the second floor may have been utilized to store material produced on the property like grains, casts of alcohol, cider, vinegar, pickered meat, tools, and extra furniture. The cool climate of the cellar also made an ideal location for the storage of perishable foods such as dairy products, vegetables, and other root crops. In 1926, Joseph H. Harwood of Plumstead Township with Frederick L. and Elsa Moore of New York sold Cedar Bridge Track to the Penn Producing Company, which retained ownership to the track, then consisted only of 120 acres until 1961. The Penn Producing Company used a portion of the property as a cranberry bog and may have installed the floodgate on the east branch of the Wading River, just northwest of the house and the bridge. The identity of the dwelling's occupants while the Penn Producing Company held title of the property were not found in historic records. During the company's ownership, of the tract, a 1949 map depicting the property illustrated the structure th southwest of the tavern and a structure northwest of the tavern on the opposite side of Old Halfway Road. The Historic American Building Survey, conducted 11 years earlier in 1938, indicated that the structure on the north side of the Old Halfway Road was a barn. In 1961, the Penn Producing Company sold Cedar Bridge Tract to Fannie Gerberts of Tuckerton, who, with her husband Joseph, sold the lot to Rudy Coning in 1969. On June 20th, 1974, Rudolf Koenig subdivided the Cedar Bridge track, resulting in the formation of a five-acre lot on which the Cedar Bridge Tavern now sits. 
Rudy resided on the property from 1969 until his death, but in 2007, sold the tract to Ocean County with the agreement that Mr. Koenig retained life rights of the property. Rudy was a rather eccentric fellow, a World War II veteran, a jack of all trades, a back to the land sort of fellow. He established enormous gardens behind the house, his own solar heating system, and had a curious collection of brick and brack, including several school buses. Although Rudy passed away in 2012, he remains a bit of a local legend. And a recent novel about the site featured his ghost haunting the grounds about his former home. There's also a rumor that he would spread that if he knew a toy was coming by on the track, he would mow his lawn naked. He's purely a, a god among men. As you can see, much has been conducted in the terms of archaeology, all of which has been done with the cultural resource management in mind and prepared for Ocean County Historic Heritage Commission, who had the aspirations to utilize the property to promote cultural heritage tourism. We're going to divide these surveys into two groups, ones conducted by Monmouth University and those conducted by Richard Grubb and Associates. With the latter group, we are going to focus on the 2015 one stage one survey and the 2016 stage three survey. The supplemental phase one and archeological monitoring were conducted prior to improvements and little was recovered. In the summer of 2010, Monmouth University Metal detected and excavated 31 shovel tests and nine excavation units resulting in the identification of 12 features, nine of which are classified as cultural. In addition to the features, the students and staff of MU recovered 6,400 and nine artifacts, of which were a small amount were prehistoric in origin. Notable features included several post molds from fencing and a possible 19th century alkygen deposit centered in the top of the slide. Based on this work alone, the property warrants designation as an archaeological site and was registered with the New Jersey State Museum as the Cedar Bridge Tavern site and recorded as all sites are with the Smithsonian Trinomial Numbering System, 28OC162. Despite the limited excavations, it was determined that the site is eligible for listing on the National Register of Historic Places under Criterion D for its ability to provide new information on 18th and 19th century farmsteads, taverns, consumerism, and foodways in the New Jersey Pinelands region. Archaeological excavations conducted by Monmouth in 2004 included an additional excavation of 20 shovel tests and seven EUs resulting in the recovery of an additional 6,797 artifacts, as well as the identification of 17 features. This testing revealed intact 19th century historic deposits in the south or rear yard of the property associated with the mid-19th century owl kitchen, as well as a rich 19th and early 20th century midden deposit. Also excavated was a 20th century wooden brocks privy, located 20 feet to the south of the tavern. Testing within the building revealed subfloor deposits predating the 19th century, as well as a dog burial, also dating from the early 19th century, and a builder's trench contemporary with the construction of the east wing of the tavern in the 1830s. Recently in 2019, Mammoth came back, because we love it here. The project was threefold. They attempted to identify any Native American occupation within the property and continue to examine the late 18th and early 19th century earthfast building identified by RGA and to identify the map documented stable located on the north side of the road. While the field school excavations were not able to identify dense Native American deposits, additional features found at the Earthfast building and the recovery of numerous artifacts on the north side of all halfway road indicated that additional archeological resources are present and can provide additional information to understand life ways at the site during the late 18th and 19th century before and during the use of Cedar Bridge Tavern. As mentioned previously, few prehistoric artifacts were recovered, and this included debitage or chipping debris and a piece of Aboriginal pottery dating to the larger woodland period. The historic artifacts cover a wide array of material, including gaming pieces, 18th and 19th century ceramics, glass vessels, and faunal remains, including the dog burial, all of which represent the complete utilization of the property and its many forms, from a tavern to a boarding house to a residence. In November 2014, RGA conducted a stage or phase one archaeological survey focusing in the pro areas proposed for improvements relating to the upgrades of the property. The survey consists of the excavation of 39 shovel tests, monitoring of geotechnical pits, and metal detecting. The work was conducted within and extended to the south and east of the area encompassed by Monmouth University. 
Stage one resource survey completed by RGA extended the arch archeological boundary of the site. And the survey resulted in, in the recovery of eight or 582 additional artifacts. And the identification of four dense artifacts are estimated across one fourth within the proposed limits of disturbance. Cluster one is a late 18th to early 19th century broadcast deposit. Cluster two is a possible location of a late 18th to mid 19th century outbuilding. Cluster three was identified as a late 18th through early 19th century tavern related mitted. Spatially overlapping cluster three, cluster four was identified as a rich mid 19th to mid 20th century tavern related mitten. The four clusters represent a potentially significant late 18th through mid 20th century archeological deposits. And in early 2016, a stage of phase three was conducted, which yielded a total of 9,152 historic artifacts with an additional 17 culture features identified within the pros limits to service of clusters one through four. Within cluster one, a post in-ground building was identified. Artifacts suggest a domestic function for a building that likely dates to the late 18th through early 19th century. This building may relate to the property's ownership by John Middleton during the 18th century. A possible late to early 19th century brick production location was also identified to the north of the post and ground building. Cluster two was identified at a possible location of the late 18th to early 19th century building based on the recovery of ceramics, wrought and machine cut nails. Cluster two also likely is the location of a late 19th through mid 20th century domestic outbuilding based on the identification of post holes and the recovery of wire drawn nails, ironstone ceramics, toys and toothpaste tubes. Clusters three and four represent a rich midden that dates to the tavern, boarding house, and tenancy periods of the site. Cluster three may contain some pre-tavern and early tavern deposits from the late 18th century to the circa 1830s. Cluster four represents later tavern, boarding house, and tenant deposits from the circa 1840 to the 1940s. If you can do me a favor and recall back to the mama slide, there were people smiling. You see how this is how it works. We laugh and giggle in the field school and get students interested. Then we hire them and we throw them in the real world in the winter, in the snow to dig. As long as the ground is not frozen, we will be out digging. Artifacts consist of earthenwares, stonewares, whitewares, yellowwares, ironstone, porcelain, alcohol bottles, drinking tumblers, medicinal bottles, candy dishes, and toys. For the most part, the material is the same as previous surveys and that was to be expected. But what does this tell us? The artifacts recovered from all investigations provide clues on how Cedar Bridge Tavern fits within the wider mercantile sphere. At its earliest times, the Cedar Bridge Tavern was in a very rural context, surrounded by forest clearings for timber, charcoal, milling, and farming. Even as time moved on through the 19th and 20th century, maps show that the tavern was never located within a de development land landscape. The stage road past the tavern brought business, news, and material goods, but it's unclear in what volume of its traffic may have been. The presence of at least two taverns the waiting river crossing suggesting that traffic was sufficient to support the establishment of both of them until at least the early 1870s. The rural nature of Cedar Bridge Tavern could have limited the access to various goods available to better connected areas such as northern and western Jersey and closer to large cities and, and their ports. The artifacts however do not support this hypothesis. Due to the quantities available most artifacts reveal geographic origins were recovered from a whole host of areas. Purchased Tabor Wales from a variety of potteries included East Liverpool, Ohio, East Palestine, Ohio, Trenton, New Jersey. Also identifiable property medicine bottles are noted to have come from Philadelphia, Binghamton, and New York City. Though the Cedar Bridge Tavern was always situated within a rural setting, this did not seem to fully limit people's access to material goods from the wider markets. As most of the artifacts with the geographically diagnostic maker's marks date to after the tavern period when business was drawn away for the area but and improved roads and rail lines. The increased seclusion still did not seem to hamper success. So what do we do with all this information? The archeological image is vast enough that it offers a quantifiable comparison to other rural taverns of the same time period. Additionally, throughout the years, various research topics have been pursued by us, including studies into the pine land or the piney culture to which the tavern provides us with a means of qualifying this lifestyle despite its remoteness. Even rare corns like this Spanish real identified under the porch in 2017 reaches the tavern. This coin is from the reign of Joseph Bonaparte and reflects an intricate link to the rest of the world. 
and for some of us at Mammoth, a link to our past. We've excavated the Alfred King's home in Bordentown, New Jersey. Joseph himself came to the Pylons in search of the famed New Jersey Devil. To us, history is more than names and dates. It's about people and their stories, and archaeology helps us tell those stories. And as you can see, archaeology has a way of reminding us how linked we are to the past, to the world, and to each other. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Sean. That was chock full of information. We will segue now into question and answers. So if you'd like to start locating your unmute button, you can do that. While you are doing that, I will read Sean a question from the chat. Um, in the chat, Sean, I have someone asking if either your reports are publicly accessible or if you can recommend some readings for people who might like more information. Um. Our reports could be publicly accessible. I think they have them at the tavern property. Um, most of the time they are restricted just based on the, the nature of the permitting. But I believe Tim Hart at the Heritage Commission and I believe they have copies at the, at the tavern. Or at the very least, they have the information we provided. Okay. All right, so if anyone wants to ask a question, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask or type it in the chat and I will read it. I'll ask one while people are maybe looking for their unmute button. Sean, um, you've talked about hundreds and hundreds of artifacts um, being found there. Is there anything that sticks out in your mind as one of the most interesting? I would think the uh, coin associated with Napoleon. Um, is it, right? but, yeah, uh, it was Joseph, <laughs> his brother Joseph. Um, the 20th century privy was uh, interesting. Um, and I think for macabre reasons, the dog burial stands out to me. It's something that was, I mean, that's something we come across, but we were digging underneath the, the floor frame. So um, that stands out to me. Okay. I have a question from Kathy in the chat. Did tavern licenses have to be renewed annually? Oh, that's a tough one. I don't know if you'll know that. <laughs> um. I would believe so, seeing as that they applied for them on multiple occasions, like you have years where they're applying for them. Um, you know, like we said, the the history, we don't get all of the documents. So if he's applying for a tavern and we have licenses from 64, 66, and 67, I would assume that they had to do it yearly. Um, you guys know too, as well as we do in archaeology, like we never get the full picture, whether the historic documents or even the archaeology. Okay, another question. Aside from the dog, did you find any cemetery or burial grounds? We did not. And that is, I'm, ha I'm okay with that. Mm -hmm. Another question in the chat here. Were there any artifacts that support a Revolutionary War skirmish in the area? We did. They did find stuff when the, the show diggers were here. Um, the... The, pro the, the interesting thing about skirmishes and Rev War sites is that archaeology, we're looking at vast time periods. Like we're looking at over 200 years of occupation. For a skirmish, you're looking at 10 minutes. So in the grand scheme of like the time frame of history, that's not a lot of time. Um, I've worked on skirmishes where you're lucky if you find a musket ball. So you're, you're going to find very little information in terms of an assemblage like that. And we do. We have things that date to there. We have musket balls. There was buckshot. And there was a couple buttons and buckles. But again, this could be people living there. But take it into consideration that the, the skirmish happened in this area. That we'll, we'll always say that there's evidence suggestive. Okay. Um, for those who are not familiar, can you describe where this property is located, right? For those who are familiar with present day Ocean County, where is it located? The, the Cedar Bridge Tavern is off of Route 72, um, east of, I believe that's 530, 539. So the intersection of 539 and 72, you literally go about, I'd say 200 yards to the east. And it's literally, there's the cell tower, and you'll see a sign real fast that says, uh, with the road, Old York Road, and it's a dirt road. 
Um, but they're open. A lot of the work we did was for improvement projects. So they have bathrooms, they have parking lots. Um, and what they did with the, the tavern was really, is really something to be seen. Okay, again from the chat, why were there two entities, Monmouth University and RGA, doing digs? Was there some sort of conflict between the groups? Um, no, there's no conflict. What it started was um, with Tim Hart reaching out to the, who's now the chair of, uh, the, of the humanities, uh, Rich Voigt, Dr. Voigt, and asked us to do, conduct our yearly archaeological field school. Um, so to help him along with these long-term improvements. We did that, and as it got more finalized that they wanted to improve the project, it's not something that Monmouth University can handle. These were, RGA comes in, and we do this for uh, a profession. These are larger excavations. They take weeks. Um, we can dedicate personnel to doing that. So there wasn't necessarily a conflict of interest. It was just more of what department or entity could bear the load. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Um, when was the last time it operated as a tavern, Patricia asks? Uh, I believe that was, we were saying in the, up until the 1870s. So between 1865 and 1870. Okay. Um, Steph asks, do you plan on returning there in the future for more digs that you know of? <laughs> the, um, we would always go back. Um, one of the things that we get concerned about is part of what we try to do is preserve these sites. So we don't want to do too much digging for the sake of digging. Um, an area that we may, we'd like to go back and check out would probably be the barn across the road. But we've, we have gleaned so much information from this tavern. It's best to preserve it and maybe future generations have better ways of doing it instead of digging it and destroying it like we do. That's a great point. I may be about to make a mispronunciation, <clears throat> so I apologize in advance. It says, you mentioned a link to Binghamton, Binghamton on medicine bottles found at the site. Is that Binghamton, New York? Yes. Okay. Um, and in what year did the map switch from Monmouth to Ocean County? So Ocean County is in that created. Eight, eight, 1850. Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, oh gosh, <laughs> Victoria, I hope you have time to listen to his answer to this question. Have you worked on any other archeological sites in New Jersey? Uh, Victoria, the short of the answer is yes. <laughs> I've been doing archeology span for 20 years. Um, at this time as a PI, I have over, I've written over 200 reports. I've been a part of myself in charge of identifying over 80 sites. So we do find sites. We find them a lot. I do this for a living. So yes, um, and some real good ones too. Just to follow up to her question, um, have you been all throughout the state or are you, you know, kind of located in Monmouth Ocean County? Um, our work has us in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, I've gone as far west as Ohio. Um, we, I'm conducting work now in Virginia at a Civil War site. Um, my work has taken me to Puerto Rico. So I'll go where there's archaeology, but it's primarily in New Jersey and the, the Mid-Atlantic, the neighboring states, Pennsylvania. Okay. What was the time frame, like roughly the beginning and end of the nearby cranberry cultivation? That was during the early 20th century with that, uh, the, pen, the pen packaging company. So they come in in 26 and then until 1961. Do you know if the county has or plans to produce a brochure that kind of summarizes all of this information? The, um, I believe that the Cultural Heritage Commission does. Um, again, they, they have it set up at the tavern. They have a nice little packet and some signage on what, what kind of archeology span has been done there. Okay, and I do know that um, Ocean County has a website dedicated to Cedar Bridge Tavern. So that may be something uh, for that uh, Barbara to look for. When was the tavern built? The tavern, the, the buildings that exist, that first, the larger section, the west side, was constructed in 1813, roughly. Um, and then the east wing, the small side, was roughly about 1830. 
Okay. Um, Sean, I don't know if you have this info or maybe they can find it on the website. Is there an actual address for a GPS? There is an address for the tavern and I think it'll be, it's listed on the, um, on their site and the cultural heritage site. Yeah, you should be able to find that website pretty easy. Um, I'll put the link uh, with the YouTube video as well for anyone who can't find it. And our last question here, which would have us kind of perfectly timed to wrap up at three. Uh, this again is in the chat. Did you find any Native American relics at the tavern? We did. We found, um, surprisingly we found less than what we thought we would. Um, like I said in the talk, it's a, it's a, it's a great location for a high probability of finding Native American occupation. We did, we do have a couple prehistoric ceramics that are of the broader woodland period, as well as we have a couple flakes or chipping debris from making stone tools. We didn't find anything other diagnostic or other tools other than the, the prehistoric ceramics, which is puzzling, but after years of digging, I've stopped asking why when we don't find things. Okay, well, we are wrapping up perfectly on time. Applause is a little awkward in a virtual setting, but I will give Sean a round of applause on behalf of everybody. Thank you so much for that well-illustrated and very thorough presentation. Um, anyone, if you want to refer back to sections of Sean's talk or share this with your friends, again, I will be putting it on the Ocean County Historical Society's YouTube channel, and I'll share that link on our Facebook and Twitter. So um, everybody, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much, Sean, for your excellent remarks, and we hope we see you all again soon. Have a good day. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Melissa. Bye, everybody.